Okay, so today we're going to talk about diffusion models, which is one of the generative models that has been had a big hype lately, not only in bioinformatics, but, but also in bioinformatics and protein structure prediction in general. So we ask you a pretty, pretty short overview of what the diffusion model is, and also give you two examples on how it has been used uh, lately for two different tasks in the protein structure field. So uh, it has actually been used for many other fields, as you can see in the paper you're going to read. And it uses, but at least in five different fields has been used in, in bioinformatics. The idea is basically is what is used behind DAL-E, if you have tried to use that, where you basically type a text, you get the image that represents the text. So in, in bioinformatics, it's been used for cryo-dragon, it's a for cryo-EM particle analysis. Single single molecule analysis. Uh, it's used for single cell imaging and in expression data analysis. It has is used for protein design, which I will talk about today, for small molecule generation and drug design, and for protein ligand interactions that I also talk about today. Uh, so that and it's probably sure some used in other fields also, but that's the one that I recognize at the moment. The, the whole idea is a bit old in 2015, but it's been really the last couple of years it's taken off. So the idea, in my respect, is like an autoencoder, which is called this now, basically, the idea is that you train something to predict itself. So you start with some input, in this case, it's a letter four, you do some kind of encoding, and often you shrink the dimensional space, uh, and then you do a, have a bottleneck there, and this is the internet box, and then you do a decoder, and you generate the same model again. So this is an encoder, decoder, training, that's an decoder. And the idea is then that you can use this image of this bottleneck space, this embedding for comparison and for other things that are useful. But that's, this is not the diffusion model, but this is like the behind the idea of autoencoder. Uh, Yeah, then you have the noisy autoencoder, this is a slight step towards a, 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 an autoencoder. And that's the idea here is that you actually partly destroy the inputs. You're trying to basically, instead of feeding it a full input that is a, a, the perfect image, you provide, you provide a noisy image. And then you actually try to reproduce the, 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 the non noisy image. So you basically try to improve a prediction. So then, it's, so that's sort of like could be useful. Then you can think about it. You have a noisy image of a photo, and you want to have a sharper. And if you have a method, you generally can work on that. It could be quite useful. However, in diffusion, you actually do this basically step by step. You basically start with an image, and you add some noise to it, or an image, or whatever you have. You add a bit of noise, and you do this not all at once, but you add it stepwise. You add a bit more and more noise until you actually get to something that is completely noisy. And then at the same time, you train a model that, that there are is the, no, the noisy, the taste is completely noisy structure, and add back until you get the structure back. So that is basically, you know, the difference here is like you actually know, I mean, you train specific being T step T away from the noisy image. You really you only do a small definition there. And there's a number of tricks you need to do that to get it to work efficiently and so on. But if you can do that, you can basically start on image noise, the noisy bit. This is still not. Very useful more than that you basically could take into poor models and maybe you can use this noisy definition for something in comparison, something like that. But you can start with noisy and see what happens. However, uh, oh, this is another example, the same thing. Um, but the difference is that you actually, if you can add a bias to your noise in the, the, the noising process, you can say, I want it to be symmetric, I want it to be look like a cat, or whatever reason you want to have it. So you add that as a as a part of the, the, the that bias here. Then you can actually start with a noisy image and generate something that is um, describing an image that fits your bias. Um, so the idea is basically you classify a guided diffusion sampling given diffusion model and then classify it in the gradient scale. So that's what you, all you need. So one so that, that means that you can basically, that's how DALI works. You basically, the bias is, I want, 
you want to make a cat image, then that's like make an image look like a cat. So then it basically adds a bias that makes it looking the image look like a cat from start to noise. Or if you want to make a cat in uh, uh, impressionistic style, it also biased to be impressionistic style, and then adds a cat in impressionistic style and so on. So it sort of like combines these things together. And in uh, diff diff doc, which is the first thing I'll go about, you can look at the video over here or read a paper if you want, if you're more interested in. It's uh, one example how this has been used for, in this case, put a ligand uh, step. So diff doc basically takes a ligand and a protein. In this case, the ligand is a small molecule that is basically flexible. It basically has all the rotatable bond and things that are flexible. Uh, and, it, and then it basically keeps the protein fixed and basically tries to put diffuse, so it's trained for starting with the ligand in the, right, in the bottom position and then diffuses it by moving it around in, in, in space. And she, you know, both both translating it, rotating it, and changing the torsion angle, so basically changes the shape of it. And then you basically do that until, until it's completely denoised, you're not in the right place, and then you try to train this denoising level method for making it find the right place again. Uh, and then you get some scores on ranking them. So in principle, you can get around it to get many, many answers, but hopefully at least the most populated one or the most liked one will be the correct one. So, that, that, so that's one of the first examples that was used for diffusion models for protein structures. I mean, it's not the first, but it was one of the first ones. And in more detail, it has, the, the, this talk uses a, ligand, a, a graph model where the atoms in the ligand, the receptors are uh, basically put to be graphs together as long as they are between five angstrom. Um, and uh, and you have some cuts from uh, uh, you 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 don't you don't have a full connected graph. You only use the ones that are between fifty angstrom or maximum twenty four connections. It's, it's position here. And uh, the receptor might be slightly different between the receptor distance cut off of the receptor and the ligand. Uh, and uh, uh, so basically, the idea is you have a big long cut off. So you basically, if you have a small bias to end up in the right place, you should always get closer and closer. Uh, yeah, and then if I, you have all the residues are actually connected so in the in receptor so on. But, but the receptor is fixed. So basically, it's, it's a point cloud of, it's not a graph with all the atoms there as a point. And a few things that are uh, key things here. It's like one is that the receptor residues, you do not embed it only with amino acid type, you know, with, the large, with the ESM encoding that I will talk, we talked about in another lecture. Um, and then, but otherwise, you basically uh, describe atoms as the types of normal features, like the atom the type, type of atom, the currency, the charge, etc., and so on. Uh, and um, they are, uh, and then you, can, you basically make a linear embedding with this one. And uh, you can also use, uh, uh, well, you can use uh, databases in form of this one. And uh, and then you basically are transformed using a learnable two-layer multi-layer perceptron. It's, it's basically a set of scalar functions to use as initial representation. And you just train it as you train another diffusion model. So basically you have uh, diffusion is basically you, you can do a ligand station, basically moving the ligand a bit, rotating it, or changes the torsional angle of the ligand. And at the end, actually works quite well, at least in the paper. So if you look at it, maybe you look at the if the eight perform of protein, which is probably comparison, and you look at the ones that are less than two angstrom away, they have like twenty percent of the models are correct compared to like maximum ten percent of other methods. So they they both are machine learning methods and non machine learning methods. So they have maybe two or three percent, and also it's pretty fast. Some other methods takes almost an hour to run, but it takes like less than a minute. And it depends on how many models you generate, but it's, it takes maybe one second per model you generate. So it looks quite good, and it might be better for the, uh, if you look at the, um, um, uh, if you look at the whole, the whole crystal, basically when the crystal or band is easier, but that's all methods better, so it doesn't, the A performance probably more, um, uh, realistic. 
So in this case, you actually you model the protein using his effort. However, lately it has been some criticism again, and there's in particular there are two types of criticism. One is actually that some of these models are not really uh, valid. So they have things like examples here, we have overlap and things like that. So they're basically colliding, things like that. Some of these can be fixed quite easily by uh, doing it there. But you can look at uh, uh, diff block here. You say, yeah, before you have percentage of predictions that are, are, are okay, it was 72%. And if you have but half of them were not valid. So basically half of them disappeared. The other criticism is actually that if you look at similarity to the training set, it clearly performs much better on data that are similar to the training set. So it indicates that it's most likely being overtrained. Other matters that we have worse in this case, in this case. So that was the first example. The second example of the future models used in, in, in protein uh, bioinformatics is for Protein design. In protein design, in the abelian protein design, they most of the tools, and I think basically all tools, divide the task into two parts. One is to generate a backbone. So it can be a backbone of, of a protein, it can be a backbone of a protein binding to another protein, or it can be a backbone of uh, uh, something already known. So and you have a backbone. And the second step later is that to design a sequence that fits this backbone. So the backbone has to be look realistic, has to be something realistic. So you have a, you have a backbone, you have two steps, generate a backbone and generate a sequence that works for folding this protein. So chroma and RF diffusion are two different methods to do it. And then this is just an example from the chroma webpage of different types of backbone you can generate. You can see you can generate different sizes and things like that, different big ones, small ones, etc. And you can actually also provide, so the idea is, uh, is the same as another diffusion model, is that you take your protein, collapse protein, you add noise to it, but you do that by in some kind of smart way, so it looks like a protein. So basically, you add the changes, not only the heat angle, thing that you, you do the fusion in a good space. And so you get something which is completely noisy, which doesn't look like at all. And then you train another uh, method for making uh, uh, reverse diffusion. And then but once you have this protein complex generated, or well, a single backbone or a protein, you're using your design network that I will talk about in the next slide, and to generate a complex of protein. Um, so, yeah, so this is the, the noise structure that looks like that, and up to the noise. Uh, and then, as you, as you can do with other diffusion models, you can actually do the, using this the conditioner that is like basically these biases in the denoising. So you can have, if, enforce symmetry, shape, semantics, substructures, etc. So that's where you use this delta log or probably of finding this. Thing. So you bias your models. So if you want to design something that's only, only alpha helical, you have a bias of alpha helical. If you want to design something that looks like the letter L, you, you put a shape complement to that. But the thing is still things like you have this all atom complex that when they put in design is is used done by something else later. And one of the most common and best tools today, but course we have here, is that you you want to decide something, if you do something like that at the beginning, but then if you condition it to be look look like a bit better, it looks more like if you have an IG fold, if you do something randomly, you end up there. But if you fold, if you call and make it look like an IG fold, it looks like that. If you have a shadow domain, it would look like that, which is more similar to something similar. And if you want something like that, that structure, if you want to have something that looks like this structure, you get something that's a bit more similar. So you can bias your sampling. Uh, and as I said, for designing the protein, you can use something, another program, often called protein MPN. Oh, it's the most frequent one, and it's actually quite good. It's also de developed by, well, this was a bake lab, but it was earlier versions. So the idea is here basically that you also have an encoder decoder, but on here in here case you have you describe your protein as in this case as the set of distances between every pair of residues, uh, and uh, from that you basically mm, uh, you have all this uh, backbone encoder that you then. Uh, and then how well does this sort of amino acid fit giving these uh, distances and other amino acids? And then you uh, iterate in the sequence decoder and you update it with the nodes, which is basically the, the amino acids. 
and I mean, this is the edges that connect them that are fixed. And, and, and then you do random, I mean, you, you do that and define the most probable one and you do this in random order and it iterates three times. And then you find the probability of each amino acid in each position and then at the end you get a sequence. At the end you end up well, one or many put in sequences and you can put in biases as you have, I want to have a glycine in a certain position, you can put in this type of biases and you can do for a single sequence or for multiple sequences, it's complexes. Uh, and then actually what you do then is to test this and you test this running alpha fold or exam fold or some other folder program by to see so does my design sequence fit my uh, target fold and in this case as you see here you have a gray structure behind this is what you wanted to design to and this is actually the structure you get out and all these cases it's uh, uh, well designed you see here that of course if you look at the overall plate of everything like in a short sequences up to a few hundred residues, you have a quite high significant of models that are that are well recovered, but the bigger protein you get, it gets a few, a few, so if more than maybe 400, it's very rare that you can design the sequence and export back to self. And then of course, at the end, you need to test experimentally, and that has been done, and many of these proteins work, not all, but many of them work. So this is clearly a step forward for protein design compared to other methods. Okay. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to talk about today. Bye. Mm -hmm.